come and do things with any library support, you guys always talk to you. We have a subject to talk. You are creative to talk. And so now it's a great pleasure that I'm going to introduce Jasmine Greenhouse from North Sydney, discussing rainbow sticker collection development, staff training, and other ways to provide for GLBTIQA communities. So welcome, Jasmine. Hi, everyone. Can everyone hear me okay if I'm standing slightly to the side here? Just so I'm not. Um, and thank you for the introduction. You pronounced my name perfectly. Okay. Yeah, that's really nice. Um, I'd like to acknowledge and pay res my respects to the, to the traditional custodians of the land in which I live and work. Sovereignty has never been ceded. Um, my name is Yasmin Greenhouge. I'm the Children's and Youth Librarian at Stanton Library in North Sydney, and I've been working in public libraries for over 20 years, and I'm a white cisgendered queer femme. Um, before I go any further, can I get a show of hands on how many people understood what I meant by cisgendered? Yes. Excellent. For those of you who are not sure, cisgendered means that I identify as the gender in which they proclaimed me when I was born, female. Um, I'm going to throw a couple of other words around like cisgender today. Hopefully I'll totally make sense. If I don't, just please pop up your hand. Um, my email's there as well. Please write it down. Um, email me um, any questions and what I'm talking about today I would love to hear people's ideas and I want to have a con conversation that continues past today and I want to hear if other libraries are doing similar things or different things that I can learn from. So thank you. Um, today I'm going to be talking about things queer. The idea for this talk started off around discussions about queer picture books and where you might put them in the collection and I'm not really going to talk about collection development today the talks veered off to the side a bit um, pitch, queer picture books the short version in my mind should just be in the picture book section not in the issues books um, maybe you could put them in the issues books if Heather's two mummies have a divorce but yeah picture book section um, so it started there but what I really want to talk about is all of the other framework around collecting queer fiction because we know that a library service is more than just the books um, so I'm going to take you on a quick sprint through some of the things I've been quietly championing in my workplace for the last four, five, six years, um, specifically looking at all the supporting elements in the library experience for queer patrons to make it a more welcoming, inclusive and useful one. And because I'm a children's and youth librarian, I'm going to be speaking about how um, queer youth might experience the library. Um, now, talking about the LGBTIQA, um, it is a little bit of a mouthful. As one of our previous speakers, Ben Law, mentioned on Twitter last week, there's not many more syllables in the word heterosexual than that. So it's a bit of a mouthful. You can shuffle it around. Um, it does stand for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, intersex, queer or questioning or both, allies and asexual or both, depending on who you talk to. I think the more the merrier. Um, some people move around the letters, my favorite quilt bag. <laughs> oh, my picture's in the way. I apologise for my really rudimentary PowerPoints here. I don't have much on that side of the screen. Yeah, oh, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I haven't done PowerPoint for a long time, so. Um, but today I'm going to be using the word queer as a catch-all. I know for some people it might be a slur, certainly for generations older than mine it can be. Um, for today, I apologise if anyone feels this, but I'm going to be just using this word. Um, now, ooh, I'm really nervous, my hands are shaky. <laughs> You're doing great. Thanks. <laughs> um, things I'm going to touch on today. Uh, oops, why is it not going? Let's just click here. Haha. Okay, rainbow stickers. So we're going down the path of rainbow stickers. I'm going to talk about gender options for library memberships. Uh, council policies, the ACON Safe Place program and staff training. Um, now, rainbow stickers. Gives the cute fuzzy focus there. I had to Instagram this when I first put rainbow stickers on the young adult books with a little dream sequence filter because 13 year old me was really excited about having rainbow <laughs> stickers on the books. So it's a bit fuzzy that picture. Um, 
the decision to put rainbow books, uh, rainbow stickers on our books was a pretty simple one for us. One of my team, the lovely Eliza over here, you can ask her questions later too, um, came and asked and um, they'd seen it elsewhere. We don't put genre stickers on any of our junior and YA books, apart from the Premier's Reading Challenge stickers. We did talk about whether it would stop people picking up the books. We wondered if it would, um, a patron would, would want to hide that they were reading a queer book, which personally I think is more of a consideration for a school context than a public library. Um, would rainbows be an encouragement or a deterrent to loans? We wondered if it would open us up to potential criticism from members of the public. Um, but in the end, the decision was pretty easy and pretty clear. We, by putting rainbow stickers on the young adult fiction, it would be a way to promote to queer kids that we support them. It's a really visible promotion that we support them. To decide not to on the off chance that of a complaint, which has so far been completely unsubstantiated and I'm happy to deal with that and have that difficult conversation if it comes up. But to decide not to add for fear of criticism, criticism runs completely counter to our intent to run an inclusive service. Um, we will not be fearful and apologetic, and by not being apologetic, that in turn gives the young people the implicit permission to not be apologetic about themselves as well. We're not afraid of rainbow stickers and we don't want them to be afraid of rainbow stickers. And for all of the other kids that might not even be looking at them, it just normalises rainbow stickers. It's not a big deal. There's just rainbows around. Plus, some of these titles are ones like Boy Meets Boy and Girl Hearts Girl. So I don't think by not putting on a rainbow sticker is going to hide the fact that they're a queer book. Their flag. Um, when we got the rainbow stickers initially, we got them made up ourselves, including supplying the graphic to the um, company. Um, Word to the wise, this is the rainbow pride flag. Uh, six colours, red at the top. It has changed over history. Um, and yes, any rainbow will do, but yeah, just good to be aware that there is actually a particular flag and trying to put it upside down. Um, now we have rainbow stickers. We started with the young adult fiction. We put some on the junior fiction, on the kids' graphic novels, then on some junior nonfiction, not a huge amount. Um, then it's moved to adult fiction, the adult graphic novels, and we're even talking about whether it's suitable on the adult nonfiction. Um, when it comes to rainbow stickers, I suppose it boils down to asking yourself why you should, why would you not put rainbow stickers on? If you're not going to put them out on out of fear of, you know, having a difficult conversation or hiding or possible hard work, then you should do it. Next, the next thing we did, I'm not really following a timeline on the things that I've done in the library service. I uh, can't really remember the timeline because it's been over years. But years and years ago, we um, we did an update of our um, library management system, and we were sitting in the training looking out how to do the new li the library memberships for patrons, and in the test system, and it had the options for gender written as male, female, transgender institution. Those were your choices. <laughs> yeah, that's what I, I was like, really? Now. This was the test database. It wasn't the final one, so it was open to discussion, which I did do. Um, apparently it was, that was from a Queensland library that I do not know the name of, so I'll leave it at that. But this ticker box option of transgender <laughs> really upset me. And I'm going to assume that everyone here has a decent bet on this stuff, but I suppose I should also say I'm saying this as someone who is not trans or intersex. Um, I do have a lot of transgender, queer and non-binary people in my life, so I just try and be a really good ally um, so, yeah, apologies to anyone who bucked this up. Um, a lot of trans people, and I know, hate generalisations, but a lot of them will decide to choose the option of female or male because that is who they are. You're not necessarily going to pick the option of transgender. There's not many people I know that would do that. Mm -hmm. So um, folks who might like the option of ticking A, third box, Look, a third gender option is a really, really lovely one, but transgender is not what it should be named. Um, folks who might like the option of ticking a third bo box might be people who are intersex, though I would say the majority of those also would choose male or female because they may identify as male or female or intersex male, intersex female. Um, people who ID as genderqueer or non-binary, so non-binary meaning they're not 
sitting at either end of the gender spectrum, but maybe here or maybe over here. Um, and people who just don't want to say. So it may not actually even be relevant to a library membership. I haven't put my gender on. I don't see, it's not a health service. It's not, why is it actually necessary? So here's a few rough guides. Here's a little bit of a rough guide on looking at the gender options on your LMS. Um, the first thing to ask yourself is why are you collecting gender? And this is something I, I really wanted to bring on today because I'd like to hope that everyone could go back and have a look and have a think and maybe, you know, champion trying to change this or shift this in your library services. Why do you need to collect gender? Like actually why? Because you might have more female readers so you're going to buy more sorts of books which means you've made a generalisation about what women want to read. Like have a good hard look at that. The second thing you need to ask yourself is no, really, why collect gender? It's really important to have think about it. What are your reasons? Are they actually valid? Is it actually absolutely necessary? The third thing that you can think about is if you must collect gender, can you make it an open field? Can you just say gender and let people fill in what they would like to fill in? Because there's a huge range of gender identities out there. Some people will say that that might skew your data. People might write down Jedi, they write down monster. But I would say that if you're asking people to fit into two gender identities, your data is already balked. If you get people to fill in an open field and they write Jedi, at least you know what the value of that is. Um, if you can't make it an open field, and that was the situation we were in, if you can't make it an open field, you need to find the best wording for it. And it's not transgender and it's not intersex because the gender queer people are not going to be very happy about that. Um, I did some researching and reading and I asked around different communities and I'm not going to tell you the exact wording that like, I'm going to show you what we did but it changes all the time and what I what we ended up doing I still don't think is right and I want to revisit it because it's been years. Um, don't put up other Please don't put up other, other just others people. It's just so awkward. So what we did end up was a bit of a mashup, and I'd like to revisit it. So on the public, on the OPACs, when people fill in things, it has the option unspecified. Oh, and also, instead of male female, we change it around female male. Just you know, because <laughs> on the staff side of the system, it's not specified. I'm not sure why we have different wording there. I cannot remember. That's lost in the midst of time, that. Um, also on the public system, you have the option of MX as a title, if you wish, apart from just the gendered options of Mr. Ms. Miss. If you have the only non-gendered one there would be doctor, you know, which people choose because it's the non-gendered one. Um, and on the public system, it's an open field. Um, so we can leave it blank if we wish. Um, the bigger picture on this is that this is a bigger general shift. And I really, really feel that libraries should be at the front of this wave. It's already happening. Many government departments and unis and major corporations and even major banks are looking at why they're collecting gender, removing gender data, opening up the gender options on things. Yes, there might be implications with health, um, with um, insurance and things like that um, and privacy but in m many instances it's not needed. Even Medicare have removed the link between what you've got down as your gender and what are the numbers associated with surgeries so we can, if they can do that with Medicare then we can have a look at it at the very least. Here's some really boring but useful stuff. The Australian Government Guidelines on the Recognition of Sex and Gender. It's publication, you can download the PDF. And they say, yep, you can have the option of M, F or X. There's a book, also a downloadable PDF, The Employer's Guide to Intersex Inclusion, and it's co-written by Pride in Diversity. Um, Pride in Diversity is an organisation that works with workplaces to encourage workplace inclusion for queer people. They've published a book alongside um, OII, Organisation Intersex International. Um, and they agree with the M, F and X option. I think they actually consulted for that. 
Um, but they also go on to say, if you're updating your forms, consider when to ask for sexual orientation, when to ask for gender, when to ask an open question. And they note that transcripts also would um, inc like prefer an open field as well. So, oh, and also Pride in Diversity, they publish a whole suite of um, small books that you should get for your library and it's all about um, workplace inclusion. It's, there's books on how to be good allies to queers in your workplace. It's a fantastic resource for um, employers. So um, look them up. Again, all downloadable as PDFs, but buy the books and put them in the collection for businesses in your area. Um, onwards to other topics. So I signed Stanton Library up as an Acon safe place. Um, they gave you a dinky little sticker for the door. Um, it's a program that's been around for a long time in various incarnations, but currently it works as a program that helps businesses and um, organisations look at how they serve the community around them and the people within them. And as part of registering, you complete a very comprehensive survey. It's not as simple as just getting these stickers for the door. And as I was filling out the survey, I had to have a good look at council's policies and procedures. Now, I was pretty pleased to find we were pretty well placed with a lot of things, but we fell down in intersex inc inclusion, like as a specific inclusion. So just quickly, I won't go through all of it, but in our bullying and harassment policy, we just updated some wording. The old New South Wales Annual Discrimination Act, well, it's still current, um, had wording like sex, homosexuality and transgender, whereas the more recent Federal Annual Discrimination Act says sexual orientation, gender identity and intersex status. Much more inclusive wording, so I got them to change it around, and they did. They changed both sexes to all genders, and instead of saying men and women, we changed it to people. It was pretty simple. So to come back to the Safe Place program, and I'm also putting up the um, Rainbow Tick program there. The ACON Safe Place program, they're currently doing a review. Um, the, um, you can email in and they'll let you know when they're finished review and they're ready to sign up more libraries. I know that a lot of libraries are already signed up and I think that's fantastic. If you're interested in how your library might go against a lot of different measures on um, queer inclusion and um, being there for the community, um, the Rainbow Tick program has a downloadable audit checklist. So you can go online, download that, and then start looking at your policies, walk around the building, have a think about things to see where your library's up to. With signing, with doing the Safe Place program, we also had to do staff training. Oh, and you also um, commit to displaying publicly this charter as well. You have to look at that on the website. I'm running out of time, sorry. Staff training. <laughs> we, oops, back one. There was an incident. So <laughs> we started out with, we did staff training. We sent an email out. We had a few minutes in our in-house customer service training and all was fine. It's all tickety-boo. And then about a year later, we had a pretty rotten incident with a homophobic patron lashing out at a staff member. Now, thanks to the Safe Place program, well, I say firstly, thanks to the strength and eloquence of that staff member and the backing of the knowledge that the library was a safe place, they dealt with the patron in a pretty clear manner, including repeating to them that this is a safe place and you cannot behave like that. So I felt really pleased that we had signed up as a safe place for that moment alone. Following on from that, management were really excellent, giving us more talk time for um, talk training and talking. And in a training course by an external provider, we were given the floor for a while, myself and my team, so Eliza and um, another staff member um, who was involved in the incident to talk about all sorts of things. So we talked about the incident, we talked about a refresher on the ACON safe space and what it means. We talked about practical ways to support and assist other staff and patrons. We, we refreshed everyone with the gender options for membership and about not making assumptions. So if someone ticks the mailbox and they come up to collect their card and show their ID and they're the girliest girl that ever girled, you don't go, oh, they made a mistake and change it because it's not yours to change. You don't know how they self-identify. So those sort of thing. And we talked about pronouns and language and the use of that with patrons. And instead of saying, oh, can you help that man over there? You say, can you help that person over there? Instead of saying, oh, this lady needs a hand with, say, oh, this patron needs a hand with. So just opening that out can make the world of difference to people. Um, from all that, and I'm nearly at the end, 
Yes. <laughs> Next, uh, things that I would like to do. Um, this has just been slowly ticking away for years for us. Um, I dearly would like there to be some sort of form guide or protocol for all of council on do, you know, why we're collecting gender and how we collect gender if we need to. Um, I would like there to be gender neutral toilets in the new library redesign. Don't know how that's going to go because we've got some sort of not changing the toilets around situation. But think about it. With your library redesign, why not gender neutral toilets? They're in train stations, in unis, they're all over the place. And there is plenty of studies out there that will show that it can actually be safer as well with single stalls. So have a think, have a read. Like actually, yeah, have a think and a read. Um, and Oh, yeah, and we just want to do more library events and community collaborations in future. In our library, we haven't really done much of that. We've just been doing all this background stuff, just slowly amongst everything else. Um, I know other libraries do some amazing things and we're really jealous, so I'm hoping to catch up soon. Um, so, yeah, at the heart of all of this has just been why are we collecting queer books if we don't do all of the framework around to make the rest of the library an open accessible space. What's the point of having rainbow stickers on the books if a staff member doesn't feel they can stand up for themselves if a patron's homophobic? One of the delights for me of working in a community space is seeing people enjoying that space. And they won't enjoy that space if there are microaggressions such as the word faggot scored across the table or something like that. So it's about working with the space, not just the books. Um, Things such as the extra gender option on membership might not make a difference to most people. They might not even notice notice it. They'll tick the box that they see that belongs to them. But for the people that it does matter to, it can mean the world. Thank you. Very interesting. Very interesting. I will say I have to highlight and question why the hell do we collect the gender one? I, I just don't know. I'm thinking about it. I will continue thinking about it. Um, so it's been an education for me. Thank you, Yasmin, for being, you know, this conversation. And now we're going to have a session or... Is Ellen here? No. Oh, yeah. Do we have questions now or do we have... You can start? have questions now, yes. Yeah. Ah, yeah. Probably like a couple of minutes. We still got a couple of minutes for. Kind of, yeah. Yeah, kind of. <laughs> okay, let me read then. Oh, Here, okay. first question. All right. This exact topic of why we collect gender was actually raised in a meeting at my library not that long ago, at which point we were told that we have to report statistics in our annual report yeah. on how many males and gender, how many males and females we have as a part of our video stats or whatever you call them these days. That, oh. Is that true? And can Brilliant. Change it if it's true. Yeah. Everything can be changed. I don't know. Um, I know. Anyone here know if that's true? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. So who do we talk to to see if we need to continue to do that? Um, well, actually, we do not. I'm gonna yeah. looking well, at our I'm statistics. We don't know your gender break gender breakdown of your clients. Mm. We know your total number of clients. We do not know how many. You know, we know children, young adults, and adults. We do age breakdown. We do not take. We do. You do not provide us with statistics on gender breakdown. So maybe like the Chinese whispers gone wrong. So if Sorry, you're getting that data, that's the wrong information. Yeah. Yeah. We require age categories. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, children, young adults, adults, and some people have a seniors category, but we do not require it. Um, Male or female? Yes. Yes. Maybe not us. Oh, it's And here we have another. I was just going to say, could, could there be something that we could do to suggest that the state library advocates that we don't need? Do you know what? Like, if something came from the state library saying we support this as a. Well, well, like council fundamentally, it is a highlight of this. Um, conversation that we have today. Yeah. And, also, I yeah. would also suggest that you take it through your association because yeah. we're not collecting the data. Um, it may be uh, something that the Public Library of New South Wales Association is. I think it's such a conventional thing that people collect that people don't question it. That's yeah. right. And so that's why it's about, but, but my suggestion is we're probably not the forum to do it. Yeah. 
because we're not collecting it, we're not requiring it. It's not in our space. We have our. I'm just going to put my researcher's hat on for a minute and make an observation that anybody doing a study saying gender patterns of reading amongst children, boys and girls, yeah. maybe to try and contradict some of those assumptions about boys and girls choose to read might find that statistics useful. Yeah. yeah. So that could be yeah, a reason. Be. Then in which case <coughs> you can still collect gender but you could open out. Oh, oh no question. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely no question. Yeah. But I think there could be some research implications. Yeah. I don't know if researchers use public library statistics, but I can see a use yeah. for them in, in that respect. Why collect gender? But there might actually be some really good reasons yes. to. Yeah. In which case, then this is a way that we can talk about how to collect gender. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think it's it's really awkward if you're forcing someone to put themselves in a box and yeah. say what their gender is, like. Yeah. Because it's like, why is this important to my library membership? Yeah, yeah. 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 The option I always choose unspecified. Like, I really just don't think it's important. Yeah. Unless there's a reason why. <laughs> but without being given a reason. Without given a reason, I'm yeah, generally not into it at all. Yeah. Um, here. Um, let me give you the mic. So, everyone, I brought Eliza with me. So, so she's just brought me up. Up. <laughs> <laughs> just hang She's out. been here for the whole of this um, for years and is very good at answering questions. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. How do you get your borrowers to complete their registration? Like a lot of ours is done by staff at a computer, so they don't, like how would you phrase questions on? Um, know, ours is done on the iPad. They can do it at home, in the library, however, and then they come up and will show ID and collect their card. We do have a paper form, and um, I don't, we're still using up some old forms, I think, from memory. The new forms will have the mm -hmm. other option on there. Um, so, okay. Yeah. Sometimes you'll get approached, like I've been approached by someone that was transitioning and they felt comfortable talking to me because I suppose I look a certain way and they think I'm, do you know what I mean? Like sometimes it's just building up that rapport and I'm not saying you can just magically, you know, do that, but it does help sometimes having like a diverse, like diverse staff as well because people will feel more comfortable with different people and that's mm. okay. I feel like as long as you're trying to warm and engaging, you yeah. know what I mean? And they were super. People. Yeah, I've had nice. people. Yeah, I've had people ask, ask me. Oh, yeah. look, um, can I change? I've had a couple as well where they've yeah. asked to change their name, yeah. and it's been a very gendered name shift. So I've said, hey, would you like to change the title? Yeah. You, do you want me to get rid of that altogether? Do you want Miss Miss? Like, Mister, mm. what would you like? I'll get rid of it. I'm like, okay. And then that leads on to the next question. <laughs> What would you like me to do with the gender option? Do you want me to move this to unspecified? Do you want to change it to male? Mm -hmm. And then they, so you just kind of ease into that as well when I mm -hmm. talk to people directly. Um, um, second part. Yeah. With your stickering, yeah. do you sticker other genres or just your <coughs> <genre>? just <coughs> rainbow? Yeah. Oh, Premier's reading challenge. Yeah. 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 Just rainbow from <laughs> just just rainbow. rainbow. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because we don't necessarily do genre stickers. But we certainly, as a Acon Safe Place, we really felt that that's one way we could very clearly say to the young people, hey, we've got you back. Mm. It's just a small. Yeah, in the adult collection, we don't. Oh, yeah, in adult, yeah. sorry. Also, not in kids, in kids yeah. especially in youth, we're very proactive in making book lists and genre book lists. Mm. So I, I'm i like very pro making book lists and I always try and make sure they're diverse and not as a tokenism thing, but because I value it and it's important and everyone's story should be reflected. You know, there's a space for everyone. That should be separate. It should be intermingled because that's kind of how society works. We're all kind of together. It also kind of just, you know, makes people feel included. You know, it's an inclusive kind of thing. And we have a uh, yeah, I just wanted to add, like, I also hate collecting titles because I don't <laughs> like making people identify <laughs> whether or not, like, their marital status because, like, yeah. Yeah. what do I need to know? Yeah. Like, Whenever I have to, I choose doctor just because. Well, that's funny. <laughs> it's not gender. <laughs> just saying how much I enjoyed this presentation. Um, it goes along with a lot of things I've been trying to get in place for a while. Um, just one for everybody. We, similar to some lady in the really funky white shirt up the back there, um, question regarding how do you sign up? We tend to just sign people with ID because we're trying to get away from wasting paper. Mm, yeah. And unfortunately, a lot of our staff just go, do you like Miss Mrs. Miss? But I distinctly go, 
ah, oh, what title would you like? And most people go, my first name. You know, unfortunately, our system requires a title. And they look at me and go, and it's usually the people who I assume are going to identify as well. They look at me and go, well, what else would they like? So I just distinguish the just deliberately go, are you a doctor? Are you a pastor? Are you a colonel or a captain? Because we also have a lot of armed forces people and the captains get the fear from the people who have decided that they're ministers rather than captains. Um, so that can be another way around doing it, not picking any of the gender, but thinking of things that are a little bit more outside the box. And just, could we could do, no, but count is gendered. Count is gendered, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's the one we're legally not allowed to do. So if somebody says to me, I'm not a pastor, but can I be put down as a yeah, yeah. Um, I get people saying, can I put down as MP? Um, <laughs> but yeah, anybody hears from me? No, I never did that. Um, <laughs> yeah, we can. Um, they can fill it in. Oh, perfect. Online, so. Yes. Yeah. But, um, relating back to my earlier question to Robin regarding stickers, I deliberately don't put stickers online. And that's yeah. not because we don't want to be inclusive, but I don't put love hearts on it. Because I get some guys who love reading romance that they say to me, oh, I get bullied if there's stickers on them. And we don't put the PRC stickers on them, again, because of the bullying issue. If I've got a reluctant reader who's 17 and they're reading a book that says, you know, for 79 years, there's that issue. Yeah. So I'd love to, how hard is it for you to get book lists? Because I did one up 18 months ago and I'm still waiting for it to be printed. And so all the lists oh, on there. I do them in house. Oh, I'm not allowed to do mine in house. Yeah, really? Can you do an alternative of like perhaps if you're a catalog? Could you do it online? Could you have a read? Just maybe try some different yeah. options because that way it's there. Also, yeah. if you want to see. The kids see, are online. The kids are online. Yeah. Like maybe be proactive on like, you know, if you have a youth blog or whatever, you could do that as another option. I think sometimes it's hard, sometimes, especially when you're enthusiastic, when there are all these like stops mm. placed in front of you, you just kind of need to find a way to wiggle oh, around they, it. They, like, they want to do it, it's just unfortunately the marketing department keep having, oh, this, um, this project's come up. Yeah, so, so if your book is just going to take that long to go through by the time it goes through. That's the problem, I now need to yeah. redo the book list completely yeah. because... And As I was just telling you, I'm leaving behind you. Yeah. Simon versus a homo sapiens agenda is not the biggest thing in that. In it. Oh, yeah. As my lovely kids call themselves now, the alphabet brigade, because they're convinced that every couple of weeks there's a new letter advertised. So we call it yeah, yeah, the alphabet brigade. Yeah, yeah. And they love it. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's their thing. Right. Um, so, yeah, thank you for this. And also thank you for the suggestions on staff training, because I've got a lovely young man who is transitioning to being called Fred, but because he doesn't have ID in the new name, we couldn't put that in, but we have the option of third name. Yeah. Staff members kept going, oh, no, you need the pink card, and I've just changed that for you. Don't ask me why we have pink and green cards for that. <laughs> That's being phased out. We're getting purple cards now, um, but we have to get rid of the old ones first. But, I, again, I ask the kids, which one do you want? We get some guys who want the pink and some girls who want the green. And, and who cares? What does it matter about, like, yeah. how much does it matter about exactly when they look at people telling it's their, their, you know, Names that they're known as opposed they're to signed, they're signing their signing legal contract. Yeah. yeah. So, so it's legal name. But yeah. just so for the kids. So you try and take them to the three thousand books they dollars worth of books they yeah, sign. Yeah, I'm doing it on a sixteen year old. Well, though. But on a kid's card, if it's then their parents. If it's written on a kid's card, I, I mean, we're talking about yeah. like where they sign. Where they sign. Oh no, we, we don't let the under sixteen year old sign because our signing thing is actually the contract that says I agree to buy by the policy of oh, so the parent has to sign it. Oh, yeah. We had a little tip. Different yeah. systems, different things. I suppose it's yeah. kind of just trying to sometimes work with what you have and mm -hmm. kind of being as positive. What you, it sounds like you're doing what you can. That's all you can do, trying to find different ways around things, on the things, or whatever. <laughs> For those who are interested yeah. in training their stuff more, could we maybe speak to you if you have some policies yeah. of what you guys did for your yeah. training so we can spread those through yeah, our market? I'm pretty sure we've got some notes and happy yeah. to talk about what we did with the training. Um, but yeah, got email address. I'm gonna and if anyone's done anything, even I haven't even touched on or touched on or thought of, mm. can you let me know so we don't have to reinvent the wheel as well? Um, that would be really good. Just little things, little Bye. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. I think especially this is um. I'm sure that this is a conversation that is just begun, you know. But we have um, the wonderful support of Jasmine, who will probably be in to share your knowledge and all the steps that you're going through and question about why the hell do we have blue cards and pink cards. <laughs> Maybe because we still um, paint the children room pink and maybe we still give them this doll. What about the boats? Sadly, I didn't have one of those because I 
I ran wild as soon as I could run. <laughs> okay, so um, we're going, wait, wait, we did that, I think. Um, so now I need to invite um, Kemal Teda from Cumberland Council. And this will be like a short session if I'm not wrong. Ten minutes. Ten minutes, and we start now. After Kemal, we're going to have Mary Gissing from Newcastle, and Dres Scott, who's ready to rock and roll here, and Alexia Estrellado from the city of Sydney. So come over, Kemal. Good to see you. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Kemal. Uh, I'm from Auburn Library of Cumberland Council. Used to be part of Auburn, uh, if you know that. I'll cover this uh, subject of the Turkish Book Club that we had in the library for a couple of years. Uh, it started in June 2015 after consultation with some members and uh, other interested groups, because there are some other groups that are happening in the community as I knew it at that time. I happen to be part of some of those groups which wasn't really organized by any libraries, it was just uh, private groups. Uh, so our meetings uh, after with the consultation with the groups as to the duration of it and uh, how long we should have it and whatever. And after the talking with the management, obviously we decided to have a secured uh, room for the library once a week, uh, once a month, sorry. So that was the only way that we have done it. And it was successful in that way, but some people initially wanted to have it once every two weeks and some wanted to have it in three weeks time. But that's the way that we have uh, gone that way. Uh, so it is happening during the library hours between six and uh, eight o'clock, uh, second week of each month. Um, so the groups is, uh, although we call it book club, but maybe we may be a bit different than other book clubs as such that uh, we just don't cover books. We just don't cover uh, subject for authors. We cover a great, probably wider section of culture, art, photography, theater, poetry, books, everything. So probably it is uh, consisting of what the Turkish borrowers are usually reading more non-fiction than fiction. That's a bit strange, probably, in some other cultures. So uh, we do cover some uh, subjects, which is uh, apart from book team, but it is like a themes for uh, on cultural sort of nature in art form or any other art form in that nature, including, let's say, photography. So you might think what's got to do with it, but that's how we do it. Um, so the members are uh, local people, people coming from all over Sydney, artists, photographers, theater play, you know, readers, general members. So um, I have uh, photocopied or printed some of those information here that uh, I can share it with you. We can take it with you later on and whatever. Uh, so I might just maybe show it very, so we call it cactus. So cactus is... I mean, you can just get a, a lot of information from it. In it, it's something, but once it's flowered, it is different. So it is kind of a different humor, I suppose. So we put all that information there as well. So along with that, we have got uh, the uh, information for each uh, session uh, about uh, posters, and we add, put that ad into the newspapers, and we share that information in their uh, Facebook. <clears throat> so that is like uh, one of the uh, theater uh, and artist uh, talking about the most common mistakes in Turkish language. And he's written a book about it, apparently. So that is that topic that is there. So this one is on um, books that you read during the holiday period. So that was done after, yeah, the, uh, February this year. So, so there are some of those themes that we cover. 
a few things that we have done with uh, the other library teams that we have covered in the past, banned books. We had a display of banned books in the library. So we think that it's a contemporary issue in Turkey, unfortunately. There are a lot of authors are jailed or journalists are still jailed and it is not a very good information. Uh, other than that, um, we cover some famous authors, novel literature prize winners, uh, some poetry works by different authors and that sort of thing. So <clears throat> the numbers consist between 8 and 25 because that's where what the room is all about. It is just holding 25 people. So we are not really trying to make it really big than that. Otherwise, I don't know what will happen. <laughs> So, uh, the group plays, I suppose, an important role in cultural development, interest in reading, and also recruiting potential theatre and other artistry, sort of work in the community as well. So, uh, I, as a professional library staff member, convenes or facilitate the meeting. I don't want to be at the front all the time and whatever, although they see me as that role, and I'm happy to play in that role anyway. Um, but at the same time, we have suggested to members from the group that who are also uh, play that role between the book club and the management or the library in that sense. So sometimes they do that, but sometimes I have to be in that sort of fill in that role. So um, I also write in the, one of the weekly Turkish newspaper, which I cover some of that aspect of the book club. Whatever we do cover, I mention it the week after, or if there's anything to do with that, I may, I may cover it beforehand, kind of a promotional sort of thing, and uh, <coughs> it that way. So um, other than that, what I can mention, uh, the other outcomes probably, although we don't have a clear uh, figures for it, that the profile of library and book clubs are improved because we also do have another book club in Arabic language. Unfortunately, we can't establish one in Chinese, which is shame, but that's the fact. Uh, Maybe another good part of this that the, one of the library member with the Turkish one, which is me covering that aspect of it, and another staff member who is also helping out with the Arabic book club. That is probably another uh, very good option for some libraries, but it may not be the option for some other libraries. So we are happy with that sort of outcome. So awareness of other library activities and events. Sometimes we mention other happenings in the library or other events information and other related cultural activities we also share with the groups other film festivals in sydney or other happenings whatever and it is also happening uh, that uh, involves with networking among members we can say that that is increased and good relationship between the libraries and members of the community other than that, it was interesting that we have uh, established or organized uh, three or more picnics from the group members, and we have read some poetry stuff and talk about literature. And it is a picnic ground anyway, but you can't really do too much about it. <laughs> so it was a good uh, attendance. So one of the meeting was attended or picnic about 50, another one is 40, and the last one, I think the one I remember, about 25. So that was an interesting part that we wanted to establish probably some links or some, you know, other organization behind, beyond that sort of book club. So that's what we do. So uh, that is about it, I think, that I want to cover. Thank you. Any questions after that? Or... One question. We are uh, not the titles, but we are actually talking to the groups in each meeting or during the meeting time 
or in between the meeting times as to what topics and what authors and what subjects we should cover. So we try to engage with the members. It's not just me doing it or me finding it, but they are also coming up with the ideas and suggestions. That's how we do. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Kamal. That was very interesting. Um, you also need to be aware of uh, when it, um, you do uh, a book club in, in another language, that you don't have the option of having 10 copies of one title. It's very limited. I mean, you're lucky with uh, probably the Chinese language, you will be able to find 10 copies of the same title. It has to be contemporary and published in the latest three years for you to find it. With other language, maybe three or just one. And so what option, and also there's um, sometimes depending on the age of the person, it might be an issue of literacy in your own language. Like you didn't have the opportunity to go to school, you just migrated when you were very young and you never went to school here. Um, so there's a combination of videos. Videos are really important for the community and books and conversation. And now we are going to invite Mary Gissing. Where's Mary? She's not, not, she's not online, but she's yes, here. I will expect something to come up on the screen. Welcome, Mary. Come and tell us all about Newcastle. <laughs> Thanks, Maria. Forgive me, this is my first attempt at Prezi. <laughs> so um, I'm expecting something to go on this. <laughs> um, first, I'd like to acknowledge the Gadigal peoples of the Eora Nation as the traditional custodians of this land and pay my respect to the elders, both past and present and emerging. Good afternoon. My name is Mary Gissing. I work as the Outreach Services Specialist at the Newcastle Region Library. Um, this afternoon I'd just like to talk a little bit about how we nurture diversity. Um, it's been such an inspiration today to hear from the range of speakers um, and, and all the detail about specific programs that various people are running. Um, I've been invited to share with you a bit about our approach to working with diverse communities at Newcastle Library. We are questioning why we do what we do and has led us to this objective in community programs and is refocusing the way we work with peoples from diverse communities. Our approach within community programs reflects a shift in the role of public libraries. Our objective is through pur purposeful and inclusive services and in inspiring experiences, Newcastle libraries cultivate literacy, lifelong learning, creativity to foster connectedness and well-being through empowered and informed citizens. Yeah, it's a bit of a mouthful, isn't it? Um, in the short, libraries enable, engage and empower all community members. This objective, while strengthening in our sector, challenges many library professionals, pushing many out of their comfort zone. That is handing over the power. <laughs> Um, our community programs and partnership team has emerged as a result of a restructure in the last 18 months. Uh, we are seeking to nurture and cultivate rela our relationships as a team and with diverse community members. <coughs> our library service, like most public libraries, is in the midst of change. I think I'm going to have to move over this way a bit. <laughs> um, just as it is in our community and society. In 2015, prior to our recent restructure, our library service did not reflect our community. 86% female, 59% uh, of the staff had worked at the library for over 10 years, 47% were over 50 years of age, no staff mem member was younger than 25 years of age, no staff members identified as Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander, and approximately 4% spoke a language other than English at home, compared to 8% in the community. 18 months later, things are changing at our library. 
the library staff, services and resources are increasingly reflecting and responding to the broader community and our community's increasing diversity. <coughs> our interim community <coughs> program's vision is that at Newcastle Libraries we are interwoven into the fabric of our community. Mm -hmm. Our communities are actively engaged. In fact, we are presently undertaking a community consultation to guide the development of our vision and strategic plan of Newcastle Libraries. That was just an invitation to be part of the conversation. But still we struggle. Having that put in another language is a struggle and that's what we need to be thinking about, having that advertisement put in a range of languages. We try to dig deep and get to know who's part of our community and we appreciate our community is dynamic and growing. We seek to anticipate shifts in our demographics and keep up to date with changes of who is living in our community. Am I going too quickly with the slides? No, no. We are community focused, not resource or book focused. How does that make you feel? Okay, good. I've got a nod there. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Diversity in our community includes Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, people living with different tangible and intangible abilities, people who are culturally and linguistically diverse, people of new and emerging communities, people who identify as LGBTQI and seniors of our community. So in outreach services, that's our focus. Like most libraries, Newcastle Libraries have both tangible and virtual. Oops, sorry, hit the wrong button. Um, have both tangible and virtual resources tailored to members of our diverse communities. Loat materials on loan from the State Library of New South Wales, bilingual and community language children's picture books. IELTS materials, literary literacy resources, and online resources such as the AIMS database, press reader, providing access to e newspapers and magazines in a huge variety of languages, tumble books for children in a few other languages. We're ironing out our links to EBSCO book, e books in other languages. We also have online links to health information and legal information in other languages. So we've got some great resources, so why weren't people of diverse communities using them? I trust you're all familiar with the gravitational fall of library use statistics when, we focus our, when our focus was on resources. The borrowing transaction was not meeting community needs or expectations. We identified a relational and transformational exchange is at the heart of collaborating with diverse community members. How can we encourage our teams to be open, understanding and respond appropriately to different cultural perceptions and needs within our communities? Our team members are encouraged to value that our society is made up of communities delightfully diverse and not a homogenous whole. Perhaps that's a bit different in Sydney where there is an incredible presence and vibrancy and um, energy from diverse communities. But it's a little bit different in regional centres. Um, so we've refocused on the communities and their unique needs. We identified for some diverse community members, the threshold was daunting, associated with oppression, or even an elite, perceived as a place only some other people were welcome. How is your welcome? And what opportunities do staff have to engage with peoples of diverse communities to build empathy and relationships? As active intermediaries between users and resources, part of our role is to reach out and connect community members and visitors to our libraries. We need to move beyond the threshold and beyond the transaction 
a transformational and sustained relationship and a two-way exchange. How can we do this? We need to cultivate our welcome and build relationships with our community members, tangible and virtual. And this only occurs through shared experience that changes positively. I wonder whether it's probably we don't have time, but I really challenge you to think about a transformational experience you've had, not necessarily in a library, but in your life. And I want to I want to throw the gauntlet at you to say why was it transformational, and to think about that. Charles Leadbeater, a thought-provoking writer in the fields of innovation and creativity, speaks about this transformational role of public services in his work with, that's the title of it, with. Leadbeater argues public services can be redesigned around relationships between professionals and service users, as well as among service users themselves. In time, these relationships transform users into producers and consumers into designers. We are facilitators to empower people from diverse community to speak for themselves. <clears throat> um, to provide transformational experiences, our organisations need to nurture and cultivate our staff and our community members. Later this year, Newcastle Libraries are planning to run a pilot program to cultivate the intercultural competence competency of our staff. This blended learning will enact professional codes of practice, protocols, standards and guidelines, as well as Newcastle City Council and library strategic directions and values. Deerdorf states, intercultural competence development is an ongoing process requiring learning, practice and maintenance. So the program will be a blended, a blended learning program and staged over about 18 months. Pam Gamara, Manager of Community Programs at the City of Melbourne Library Service, and Susie Gately, Manager of our Library Service, articulate our engagement approach succinctly with these three words, for, <laughs> for, with and by community. We need to transform from doing for community members to undertaking programs and services with and ultimately to hand over and empower and support community members to lead the programs. Our industry has done this previously with our transition from card catalogues to open access library management systems. So let's take a look at a few of our programs. Most of our successful programs are collaborations. Um, these programs are supported and accompanied by tailored targeted promotion, both visual, uh, sorry, both um, virtual and hard copy. We also seek to display what we call our creative seeds. That's our resources display at many of the events, uh, at many of the programs we hold. So they're not just the program, you actually see that, you know, a range of resources that are relevant to what's happening. And we do evaluations of both our participants and hopefully our staff post the event. So we want that two-way feedback and we want to respond to it, not just do it and hold it on the, the desk and make no act, take no action with it. We try to build on our programs for diverse communities, improving them each time through responding to the evaluations and involving and empowering more community partners each time. I fear I'm going to run out of time, so I'm going to just time. have I? Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, there, as you can see in the tree there, there's a range of programs. I'm just going to flash up some pictures. I'm not going to talk through them. NAIDOC Week. Yakka Day and Indigenous Careers Day, where the kids actually made... Uh, bookmarks one year and then they were published and we had permission to publish them and hand them out the next year. Youth Arts in Recovery and Hunter Homeless Connect. Uh, transitioning from just promoting resources to actually exhibiting uh, exhibitions, 
driven totally by community and having two-way communications with managers in our library to seek uh, a real dialogue with people. Home library service <laughs> involving a canine companion as well and um, also uh, our craft groups making um, you know decorations for our home library service patrons. Um, tech Savvy Seniors, thank you to State Library um, for the funding to do this with the Cantonese, Italian and Arabic speaking communities and then to have a graduation ceremony where many of those communities can get together and talk across communities. Um, a Seniors Week program delving into wonderful Noel collections about Noel Coward. We have a great volunteer in our library who's just a dynamo and a an amazing man, his name is Peter Trist, and he developed this performance that was held in collaboration with the art gallery next door and had, you know, 130 people there. Um, and new and emerging communities, uh, bilingual story times um, and opportunities for artists from emerging communities to speak about their work and their experiences. Thank you for listening. Um, and um, I wish you well in your programs. I'd love to hear more about yours. I'd love to be inspired more about yours and for you to come and visit us too. So feel welcome. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And now uh, I'm going to look at you, Dr. Scott, from Ashford Library, which is now part of the Inner West Council. Is this so yours? Okay. Oh, yeah. Hello, everyone. Diverse reading, I think, is a terrific topic for a seminar because it, it highlights all the different books, authors, uh, lecturers, readers, customers, staff and topics out there which we as library professionals have to bring together and promote. So most of you know that Authors at Ashfield has run since 2002, so that's we're now into our 15th year this year. So a rough calculation was over 700 book talks and lectures. The program is marked by the diverse range of topics, speakers and books, so the podcast necessarily reflect this. Our community, like all of yours, is diverse, as are our collections. So the way I've programmed the talks has always been with this in mind, that there's many inquiring minds out there and lots of topics which appeal to them. So we've had a range of topics, book talks, lectures, from Chinese poetry with English translation, romance fiction panel, crime fiction authors, um, lectures on Raymond Carver's short stories where everyone has a copy of the short story and the lecturer goes through it line by line and we dissect the story and learn more about it and the usual books talks where the, the authors are in their publishing months so they're publicising the, the um, talk. So the audio of some talks as you can see has been recorded since 2015. I don't record all the talks because one, I think it would just be overkill because we run at least three to five a month, sometimes six. And I also want to keep getting the numbers in um, to the talk. So I don't tend to advertise the talks will be audio recorded beforehand. I just let people know on the day. And some presenters I know I've already approached them, they don't want to be recorded as well. So that's another thing. So I'm now aiming at recording one a month, particularly ones which the authors just a talking up here on their own, they're not presenting with uh, PowerPoint. And as you know, it's very hard these days, most people want to use PowerPoint, but I think it sometimes detracts from the audio when you haven't got the PowerPoint there in front of you. And the other thing with diversity is that I do try and get a range of lecturers because they all bring different ideas to their topic and it's different for the audience as well. You have to keep refreshing programs. So there's a range of speakers who are authors, who are professional speakers, who are just specialists in their particular topic. And um, we had a really good speaker last week. Monique's had her at Tom Sutherland, Dr. Pasuda Chandra. And I've just from that talk, I've got two more people come and they said, can we give lectures at your library? So they're coming in August and September. So presenters are asked permission to be recorded and we have a standard form that's given to them to complete and sign. 
and it's the same form that we use for our oral history recordings and I can email it to anyone who's interested. My colleague Annie Hyde purchased a great piece of recording equipment to record our oral histories and this is the one that I use for the author talks. It's easy to use, I can use it. It's a Zoom H4N recorder, it's just like that big. So once recorded, I very confidently hand the device to Annie Renee's looking at me, and she expertly uploads it to our website along with details of the event, including the author photo and a program if applicable. Scrolling down to show you. So for the GLBTQI evening of readings, we had a program as well, and for the Vietnamese evening in 20, April 2015 to celebrate the 40 years of uh, the fall of Saigon, to, to remember it, uh, they did a program. So on the day of the talk, there's a sign for all attendees that the audio is going to be recorded and also included in the speech as well. So why do I record some of the lectures and book talks? The accessibility of service that we provide to people. Not everyone can physically come into our libraries for the event for various reasons, whether they're just busy or they're housebound or they've, just, they've got children they've got to look after. You know, there's various reasons. English language learners, I'm trying to make the service accessible to them. We have English language conversation classes. They take place in the Civic Centre every Friday and they're run by community programs. A few weeks ago, I went down and met with the teachers and presented the program to them, presented the flyers and said, can you promote the podcast to your, your 100 students they have every week? It's really successful because I think it would help them with their English language to hear people speak, to also be part of the community as well. And along with that talk, I also promoted the program as a whole because they can come up, listen to colloquialisms, listen to the Q&A, just to get the feel of the language. So they're very happy to um, promote that for me. It's also an historical record. Apart from photos and evaluation forms, which we all do, it's a permanent audio recording of the event and it marks a time and a place in not only a library's cultural history, but a snapshot of literary events and the world of books and also the culture of a place at a certain time. It brings the event to life again up to months or years. There's a few favourites on here and I'll sometimes go back and listen to them and remember the night and it's just a really nice thing to do. And of course it also promotes our collections and reading in general. To me the podcasts are another collection to promote, like spoken words and ebooks. They provide another way for our readers to connect to our collections and to authors they may not be familiar with, to cultural topics they want to learn more about, to literary themes and so on. The preferred talks to record, as I've said, are really the ones that are just book talks, but I have done lectures. But I do think sometimes they can lose their relevance because they're talking to the PowerPoint. Show me a page. I'm already showing it. Okay, so just scrolling up. So for History Week, um, these are just some of the ones that I've picked. We do landmark talks, so if you, no, that's Heritage Week. I get them mixed up, don't I, Joanne? Heritage Week and History Week. So we had Douglas Newton, he had a PowerPoint, brilliant presentation, just wonderful. One of my favourite talks ever in 15 years, um, Sheila Pham organised it. We had 175 booked and 175 came. And so they did the program for it and it was emerging young Vietnamese Australian readers and writers. It was wonderful. So I'm going through, yeah, Robert Wainwright, bless, bless him, he just had a book talk. So that was his new book. He's got a new book out as well. Another favourite talk was the GLBTQI Evening of Readings. We had Benjamin Law, C.S. Pacat come up from Melbourne, Nigel Bartlett, various other people. So what I'm looking at as well is who is likely to come back to the library. If they're not likely to come back, I want to report it and I don't think we're going to get the Vietnamese writers again. I don't, don't think we'll get that calibre of speakers again for the GLBTQI evening. Uh, we always record Sydney Writers Festival now, so we'll record our event this year as well. Uh, Tim Soupamasan, we do a Read This promotion campaign, which is our book of the year every year. I haven't done one this year because we're getting things sorted with the amalgamation. But Dr. Tim Supamasan came and talked about his book, I'm Not Racist But, so we recorded that. Eloquent, erudite, as you would expect from him. And I thought, well, he's not going to come back, and that's a real landmark for our library. And we had also a few Cambodian people come up from another suburb because they wanted to listen to 
someone from their country. So that was really nice. Uh, again, History Week, I've got the week right, September last year. So we have Dr. Lisa Murray, City of Sydney historian, but as I've said, will they come back to the library? Well, yeah, she's coming back this Thursday. She's doing a talk on Sydney Cemetery, so we might record that one as well. And now recently, Collins Hemingway was an American author visiting for the Jane Austen Society. So he came to talk to us about the real world of Jane Austen. The next talk I'm going to do is probably April 19. It's an evening talk about um, a woman's memoir about her travel from Sydney's North Shore to living and teaching in Columbia. So that might be good. So just to conclude, I do believe that all at Asheville programming is diverse. I try to make it as diverse and interesting as I can. If I, if I think I want to come to a talk, I'll put it on. There's so many books and topics out there, so much to learn about for our reading community and our community in general, who may not necessarily be big readers, but they just are interested in topics. Like when you have the RM podcast, it's just something you're interested in. So the podcasts are also an additional stream to our programming. And now that we're recording them, I wouldn't stop recording them. And I wish I'd recorded them in 2002. <laughs> they were wonderful. Thank you. It's just on the council website, yeah. Thank you very much. Very